Hello and welcome. In this video today, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at understanding stimulus text in short answer questions. And we're going to be looking at uh, a couple of examples, or at least one example anyway, of being able to respond to a stimulus text which you're pretty much given on the spot. Now, one of the things about it is you need to be able to interpret it, you need to be able to analyze it very quickly, and then you need to be able to compose a response in a very short space of time. And especially when you're under pressure, this is quite difficult to do. So it requires you to re um, respond to a number of prescribed stimulus, and usually you have to read them and understand them first. Um, it gives you a very limited amount of time, which particularly, uh, I know for, for many students, it is a bit of a, a constraint and something that's quite difficult. Um, but also that there are shortcuts available. Now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend always taking shortcuts and things, but in this case, when it comes to your organization process, and particularly uh, the, the steps when it comes to composing a response and certainly being able to come up with an answer, there is a way to be able to do it quickly. And what we're gonna go through today is mainly to look at tr trying to speed things up, but also trying to add some more depth to answers to be able to, uh, to really make sure that we can connect uh, a stimulus text to a question in a meaningful sort of way and do so in such a way where we are able to really um, not only uh, make a complete answer but one that is airtight, that satisfies all the criteria that would have been asked in the question and being able to uh, respond to or use evidence from the text and how you would use evidence from the text. So we're going to look at all those things. So to start with, let's look at the reading of the text bit because that will be the first step when it comes to um, understanding your stimulus and certainly being able to respond to your stimulus. Now it does take time, and especially if you're one of these people who is not necessarily a quick or a confident reader, then there are some ways around it, and we're gonna go through a few of them now. There are some strategies which help to make it a bit easier, and even if you are someone who can read fairly quickly, there are these are a couple of strategies which will make it even faster for you. And certainly, one of the things that, uh, and, and certainly I'm a strong believer in this, is that you don't necessarily have to read everything word for word. For instance, you can read the topic sentence and paragraphs and skim the rest. You can look at the questions first, although this one can lead you in a bit of trouble occasionally if you don't do it the right way. Or you can look for keywords within a text. Or, or basically look for sections which stand out, look for key pieces of description of um, ideas which basically you're doing as you're skim reading it. Now, the reason why you would do these sorts of strategies is first of all, your, your comprehension questions will not ask you to analyze the whole text. They'll ask you to analyze bits and pieces of it. So to read the whole thing is a bit pointless when you've got questions only asking you to maybe respond to about uh, 20 or 30 percent of it. If it's a question which is asking you to refer to the text as a whole, even then you don't have to refer to the whole thing. You don't have to take examples from each paragraph. You can quite simply refer to a couple of key ideas that were taken from different sections of the text. So again, you're not uh, responding to the whole thing. So by skimming it, you're helping to give yourself a little bit more time for your planning, your organization, for developing your response in a lot more of a meaningful sort of way rather than necessarily having to read the whole thing. Now, <clears throat> as I mentioned with reading, understanding a text word for word is not really important either, especially as some sections will give you something which uh, uh, refers to symbolic rather than literal ideas. In other words, that uh, even if you don't understand the point of a particular symbol, and, and certainly when you're reading something, especially in a hurry, you're not really thinking about what sorts of symbolism and what sorts of form and technique you used. And certainly when you're reading something quickly, or if it's a text that you're not quite sure about, you don't really need to know the whole thing. And certainly a general idea of what the text is suggesting can often give you enough for a very, very good response. Provided, of course, that you refer to the um, the text in a broad sort of sense, and then are able to use specific examples. Now, those specific examples can refer to the bits of the text that you were able to read quite comfortably and you were confident in being able to answer a question on them, or to be able to answer a section using that um, piece of the text as your evidence. Either way is fine. So, 
But the main thing, and, and certainly this is something I, I see virtually all the time when, when students are responding to uh, exam papers, is they'll get hung up on not understanding something and they'll panic and then they'll start really worrying and they'll spend that time uh, trying to interpret that one section rather than just very quickly reading it and being able to respond to it without sort of realizing, oh, hang on, that's not part of the question anyway. So it's something that even just a general idea will actually give you enough for a starting point. Then you use your questions to sort of refer to what parts you actually really need to focus on. Remember as well that English requires you to discuss the ideas, not simply repeat or respond to the text. As in, even if you get a difficult text, it's not asking you for a, a retelling in your own words. It is asking you to discuss ideas. It, it's asking you to, to be able to discuss the text and use your text as a reference rather than the other way around. No text should ever drive your response. The text should be there to support your answer and to prove what you think is true, what your ideas are. So to, ha to basically live and, and, and breathe by what the text is saying is not the, the correct approach and certainly not a, a strong approach to being able to respond to a comprehension question. What you need to do instead is you need to have an idea of what your answer is and then be able to use the text to back up what you're saying. Or certainly integrate the text into your answer. Now let's have a look at the, the using the knowledge part. And certainly once you have a general idea, how do you use it? Well, comprehension, in, infer, inferring and interpretation skills require you to use knowledge of your stimulus text. And basically this helps you to inform an answer. So we're going to have a look at it in the form of example, and then we'll also explain this image here. So we're going to be looking at how the nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty, is symbolic of the fragility of human life. So there was a point to this creepy image. It's not just there to, to scare you. Okay, so we've got a question there. Now, Humpty Dumpty, I'm sure it's a story you're quite familiar with. If not, it's only four lines. Look it up. Um, and... Basically, it's one where you can interpret if you spend way too much time looking at things very, very closely as something that symbolizes the fragility of human life. And of course, the first question I get often asked by a lot of students is, why are we talking about something like this, for instance? It's just a kid's story. Well, every story can be interpreted. Every piece of text can be interpreted in a certain way. And certainly, even if it's, the text is not designed to be interpreted, no text, I think, no literary text has been designed to be interpreted. Shakespeare didn't write his plays 400 years ago to, for, to annoy English students. He did it because he wanted to entertain people of his time. But it's something that we do now as a way to sort of communicate ideas that we learn from reading and learn from uh, being able to read and analyze something. So using your knowledge shows that you have read it, that you understand it, and you're able to um, come up with your own ideas based on it and to be able to use it as a sort of a collaborative measure to be able to further your own understanding of concepts and ideas. So in this case, if we're looking at the term um, how is the nursery rhyme Humpty Dumpty symbolic of the fragility of human life, really we're just using it to, as a collaborative way of looking at how human life is fragile and looking at the importance of that. Now it is a life lesson, it's a life skill, but it's also an important question which can be uh, represented through text. All right. So inferring an answer is important this one because it's not talking about the fragility of human life and certainly because of the fact that it is about an egg. It's not about, um, yes, okay, the, the king's horses and men come in, but uh, this question is more about an egg. So we're giving an egg human qualities. It's, it's anthropomorphic. It's, uh, it's, it's basically it's a non-living thing taking on human qualities or something along those lines. So it, it's one of those things where... Um, You've you've got uh, this object where you've got to now infer how this is related to humans. So, and this is where this link has to come in and has to be represented quite strongly because obviously the text itself doesn't refer to it explicitly. And certainly, even if you would, if it did, you would still need to uh, discuss it. So, if I say the failed efforts of the king's men to resurrect the fallen egg is symbolic of human inability to stop death. The first thing I need to do still is I still need to link that to fragility because that's just talking about death in this case. It's not really getting, it's, it's sort of hinting at why human life is fragile, it's because people can die. And because of the fact that uh, they'll try to resurrect this, this fallen egg, 
But I still need to con connect that to fragility. This is where going back to the question is really important. So this is what I'll do. I'll link it back to the question. So the fall from the wall or power to death indicates the ease by which the human condition can fail. This failure represents fragility of human life. Okay, so this basically, this death is, um, is symbolic of how basically people can be in really top health one day and not be in top health the next. And so it represents how things are basically quite fragile in that sense. So Humpty Dumpty, not only is it a story, a lovely story about an egg falling down, it's also a very symbolic story for the human condition. And in short, this three-line answer, and this is only three sentences, it uses a stimulus, as in the stimulus text, in which case it's only four lines, the answer's almost as long as the text. Uh, it provides an inference, as in it makes a, uh, an, an idea, it, it develops an idea, it's an idea which re refl reflects comprehension, and then it relates back to the question. So it's basically saying how I've comprehended this and how this now relates to the question. So if we were to look at, at this chain and look at the, the question, comprehension, text and inference bit in the middle there, we've got the process of what it is that you're doing for answering short answers. And this is the process you should be using for all of them. Once you've got the stimulus and once you've basically um, looked at it, this is the, the basic idea. First of all, you use the text. And the stimulus is always, it is important. It is still something you need to refer to as a, a measure of what it is the, the text has done. You need to comprehend, interpret, and infer where necessary or as the question will dictate. And then you need to link it back to it. You need to make sure that that link is quite strong and is, is quite um, supreme when it comes to uh, developing your answer. Okay, so looking at that example, yes, that was a, 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 an example that you probably won't come across, but it's one of those things that uh, it's, it's basically, it's the process that you need to use which is important and not necessarily focusing on the kinds of text that you use. Of course, the best thing is to keep an open mind about an answer and certainly to not lock yourself into certain kinds of responses. If you think that a stimulus requires a different kind of response than what you um, may think initially, and that by thinking about it, even briefly, that there are a number of pot potential answers, you need to then choose which one's your best. And certainly with a question like that, for instance, it's one of the ones where I could come up with a number of different answers and explain them and justify them and got a completely correct answer every single time, just by simply going back to the question again. Anyway, that's about it for uh, understanding stimulus. So make sure that one of the things that you uh, really reinforce and, and certainly keep in the back of your head is that um, when you're reading a text, it's not important necessarily to understand it. And certainly understanding is a very um, a loose term when it comes to English and certainly when it comes to literature. And the reason why it's such a loose term is because English texts can be read and understood, but they can also be interpreted, they can be viewed symbolically, they can be viewed poetically, they can be um, hinting at things, they could be allegories for things, they could be a number of different things. So if you keep an open mind and consider all of those possibilities, then you're well on your way to succeeding as an English student. So until next time, I'll see you later.